Another interesting change in uh, the diagnosis of autism, uh, it used to be uh, it used to be before the age of three, and now they're expanding it too, which gets interesting when the demands of society overwhelms the individual's ability to adapt to society's demand as they get older. Which means that you can have some kids who are maybe a little quirky and unusual, but yet they're still kind of functioning in the early years, developmentally, preschool, kindergarten, first grade, but as the social demands increases and as other kids grow out of uh, certain types of uh, appropriate developmental behaviors, they're kind of stuck. They're not moving ahead. And that could take place after the age of five, at the age of eight. So, and, and I'm liking that. Again, they're going with, uh, you know, let, let's not ourselves be very restrictive and when to call this because we because the research says some of these kids do find up into a certain age and then boom they're having the problem and doing that and you'll see that with other disorders too like in schizophrenia as well so uh, that's a welcome change as well the uh, the developmental stand stand uh, uh, span is usually considered uh, up to the age of 18 and that's typical and again clinically I've evaluated 50 60 year olds who I had to go back and diagnose uh, with disorders that at one time were typically in the developmental period because they did not apply for services until then so th that could happen uh, as well in doing that uh, I guess what I'm saying at that point is, is that that isn't a new onset that's always been there, but has not been brought to the attention until much uh, later in, in, in the years. Will some folks be left out? That's the, probably the slide that uh, the professor is talking about. Uh, and again, just to reiterate, uh, I think some, some people will be left out and just may be viewed as just being different. But again, you know, if there's socially significant problems in occupation, education, uh, getting along, or, or them themselves are in duress, uh, then there is no diagnosis. However, a lot of the people who were diagnosed will find themselves uh, in a better situation because they're going to be much more appropriately diagnosed and having treatment that's going to be uh, much more effective because you're really uh, working on exactly what the target behaviors uh, need to be in relationship to their uh, uh, their presentation. There are, uh, with, as we were talking, I think uh, the lady over here talked about uh, coding, severity, etc. Besides that, HUDAS, many of these disorders, especially in the developmental uh, disorders, uh, do require severity rating and doing that. What's changed is the severity ratings now are based on the level of intervention that is required. So, for example, in autism, a level one, uh, you're going to need, uh, you know, requiring some support, like can function in, in a regular education class. However, you're going to need an itinerant teacher to make sure that person uh, or that student is following through on assignments and et cetera, uh, or uh, coaching social skills in the classroom. So that could be a minimum uh, uh, or requiring some support. And then as the amount of support is required for that person to function as independent as possible, that doesn't mean they're going to be independent, but independent as possible, uh, and it goes up to the most severe of level three. And again, it's very nice, and again, it's looking at a lot of behavioral evidence, uh, not only just medical, uh, but also uh, what we need behaviorally to work with these individuals. Again, any good diagnostic system or taxology uh, uh, needs to uh, pay attention to not only DS to uh, a diagnosis, but also uh, relating it to uh, treatment. Uh, the spectrum, the autism spectrum, you can also specify uh, with uh, accompanying uh, intellectual impairment which uh, is very important 
One, uh, obviously, the prognosis for autism uh, improves with the high, you know, higher the uh, IQ. The lower the IQ, which is more often than not, uh, usually a lot of uh, autistic people uh, do have, tend to have uh, lower IQ, the prognosis is, is not as good. Actually, a famous uh, behavioral psychologist, uh, Eva Lovas, demonstrated that back at UCLA uh, many years ago. I'm giving away my age, which is many years ago in doing that. Okay, let's move on uh, to the next uh, neurodevelopmental disorder, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. Uh, what has changed here, first of all, as we were talking about before, there's a lot more examples and again, and I can't probably say it enough, there's more of an insistence that before you call something a disorder, it has to be pervasive. It can't just occur in one place and no place at all, which I get all the time, especially with ADHD. My kid is doing horribly in school. More often than not, it's males. He hates schools, he doesn't like to, he's immature and then gets the diagnosis of ADHD, but otherwise he's playing baseball, you know, he's getting along with his siblings, he's not putting uh, animals on fire, nothing, not doing anything like that, but in school, kid can't stand it. I and mean, we call him DA, we'll, we diagnose that. Uh, yeah, what also has changed, the uh, onset uh, before seven has changed to now uh, 12. Let me just see what this next one is. Uh, okay. And also uh, that it goes up through the lifespan. That means adults also can be uh, diagnosed as uh, having uh, some form of uh, ADHD. The subtypes are still there. There's uh, ADHD uh, impulsivity, uh, inattentive type, and a combined type. Uh, and there's an ex much better examples of uh, when to diagnose somebody uh, with one of those subtypes. Again, a much better uh, job. This next one, comorbidity with autism spectrum disorder now allowed. I I'm still having a hard time with that one. So if someone is autistic, they can also have a diagnosis of ADHD. Ah, uh, you know, someone who's autistic, they tend to, uh, you know, one of the problems is that they're usually non-compliant and some of the things you do at the beginning is compliance training. So I, I don't know, I'm having a hard, I guess it, it's above and beyond what you would usually expect with someone with autistic. Uh, to diagnose uh, with a, an adult with ADHD, uh, the criteria, uh, there's got to be five symptoms, and for children, uh, they require six. Obviously, kids have a little bit more excessive behaviors, there's more tolerance, so you have to have more uh, symptoms before you can be diagnosed as a child with ADHD. Also, severity rating, again, uh, depends on the number of symptoms that an individual uh, presents with as well. Uh, other disorders uh, that mimic ADHD, and this is my little platform to um, get people a little bit more sensitive about this, uh, you need a good differential diagnosis. All those disorders you see can mimic ADHD. And I see this, especially with, uh, I see this a lot with uh, females, female students in, in high school where I'm seeing ADHD diagnosis when they're coming in, being, coming in with depression. And when you do a good diagnosis, you know, people who are depressed are not the most energetic people who want to be paying attention to long, tedious things. You know, they're distracted, their mind's somewhere else, or they're just uh, lethargic and they get uh, the diagnosis. Uh, oppositional defiant disorder. You know, kids who don't want to do what you're told, we're told, oh, yeah, they look like they could be ADHD. Learning disabilities. The day I went to graduate school and started learning about uh, specific learning disabilities, the first thing we used to get taught was that kids who have learning disabilities act like they're not paying attention, especially the ones with the language disorder. Why did he act that way? Because they don't have a clue what's going on. You put a six, seven year old in a classroom and the teacher's going on and on, it's just like drumming sounds come to that kid's ears 
and you know he's going to do other things to escape all that. So uh, more attention needs to be paid uh, to that, and those, and that's listing some of the other areas where ADHD could either be uh, comorbidly uh, 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 be diagnosed with, or seems to uh, get misdiagnosed because of a more uh, uh, more accurate or a lack of an accurate diagnosis. I knew that. All right, specific learning disorder. This has been a welcome change. It is rare, well, in the old DSM-4, they used to have specific language, uh, learning disability, language disorders, and reading, math, written language, and they used to have all these neuro neurological terms like dyscalculia, dyslexia, uh, dysgraphia, those are all gone. And they're all gone because a lot of kids who present with learning disorders, it's just not that clear. You know, kids who have trouble reading, guess what? They have trouble with applied math. Or the, uh, the other way, kids who have trouble with math oftentimes will have some reading problems. It's not that easy to say one or the other. And that's been a, a nice change. So now it's uh, combined into one disorder, a specific learning disorder. What has happened in the public schools over the last four years, they have uh, introduced this concept because of the new reauthorization of uh, special education at the federal level, where there's more of an insistence on what we do the kids in the classroom and intervention we use that's going to determine whether or not a child is going to be diagnosed with a learning disorder. So part of the criteria before you give somebody a learning disorder is that there has to be a minimum of six months of interventions uh, and with little or no gains. Very nice. The other uh, significant shift in, uh, in, this, in this diagnosis is that the discrepancy formula is no, no longer used. And all that meant was years ago you had an IQ and if the kids achievement scores were significantly below the IQ, which, and that was kind of fuzzy because if in elementary school it was one standard deviation, in uh, middle school or high school it was one and a half to two standard deviations. In other words, if you had an IQ of 100, your achievement score in elementary school, let's say, was uh, 85, then you might be eligible for a diagnosis for learning disability. As, and some states, like Florida used to do, you also had to show a processing test, and it's very complicated, as you can see. So theoretically, if I randomly pick somebody here and did an IQ test, and let's say, you know, for most master's students, IQs are 120 and higher. Let's say your IQ is 120, and I do an achievement test, and you're on math, it's uh, a 100, you may have a learning disability. And of course, the numbers were astronomical, the number of kids who were being diagnosed. You know, the, the classic one, Einstein had a learning disability. Oh, really? I want what he had. <laughs> you know? Uh, anyway, so uh, now it's a little bit easier. It's based on intervention. And is the child forming, uh, not performing what you would reasonably expect, given that individual's age and uh, developmental uh, level? much nicer, cleaner uh, way of doing it. Another nice uh, change has been uh, the subtypes. Again, it, uh, a, a, a taxology system has to uh, take a look at not only a diagnosis, but where does treatment come in and, and you know, treatment is based on what the diagnosis is. So a good clinician or, uh, or an educator will also put down exactly where is this person having difficulties academically. So in math, it could be with calculations or number concepts. Math, reading, uh, reading could be reading fluency, uh, phonics, reading comprehension, uh, writing, written language could be grammar or uh, inability to formulate sentences, etc. So those subtypes are, are still clear and, is, and uh, they've done a much better job of giving examples. Yes, ma'am. Before they get a diagnosis, but how do you get the intervention when you don't have a diagnosis? 
what happens is uh, the kids, and that's great, because what happens in the classroom, the kids will start you know, uh, failing, failing uh, spelling tests, for example, or math, and the teacher now obviously will refer to uh, student study team for interventions. In the public schools, they, they're now calling it response to intervention. And that is the first step before a child gets uh, diagnosed in doing that. Yeah. Uh, again, as uh, I'm reiterating again, the severity level is based on the level of intervention that is required. Uh, in the public schools, there are three tiers. If you get to the third tier, then you're referred to uh, special education for an evaluation and doing that. Motor disorders. Uh, now, they've taken all these other uh, disorders that used to be called first disorders first diagnosed in infancy or childhood, and it's just moved under uh, motor disorder. That, that's the biggest change. And there's a spectrum of uh, what, uh, different motor disorders, and again, they will co-vary with some of the other uh, neurodevelopmental uh, disorders. Uh, the Probably the one that uh, is the one that stands out the most, uh, well, two. Uh, the stereotypic movement disorder with or without self-injurious behavior. So you can have somebody uh, who uh, does self-injury, you know, like wrist cutting, et cetera. Uh, and at one time, you know, it, you know, kids who looked like they were autistic had these behaviors and they were being diagnosed as Asperger's. This is one of the areas that someone else, uh, one of these kids could fit into. Uh, also what's changed is a, a provisional tick disorder. Uh, and that has to do with the duration of how long a tick uh, uh, is uh, exhibited. And it's usually under uh, six months. Well, actually the provisional is within one month. They have also done a much better job of defining the criteria across uh, the uh, DSM-5. Uh, the old DSM-4, there were a little bit uh, different diagnosis uh, for a tick disorder or movement disorder in, in, in one diagnosis versus another. So they've cleaned that up uh, very nice. And Aaron will talk about uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, but what has uh, been taken out is, is a dis is, uh, uh, body focus repetitive be bis disorders. So one time I was under motor disorder, so like trichotillomania, dermatillomania, which is, you know, skin excoriation. Uh, that comes under uh, obsessive compulsive disorders. So those are, are specific goal-directed behaviors. What comes under stereo movement disorders are those random stereotypic behaviors that are really a purposeful, uh, lacking in purposefulness. I got 10 minutes to cover schizophrenia. <laughs> Do the best we can, all right. Uh, probably, I would say in the next, other than personality disorders, this area is gonna undergo the most significant changes uh, that we've ever seen. Off the bat, I'm sure, you know, how many of us know the, uh, the, the characterization of paranoid schizophrenia. You know, that was a diagnosis for years. Uh, that's gone. Those subtypes are gone. Now, when I say they're gone, they still will show up in the DSM-5, but and it could be a subtype of a delusional disorder. And why do you think they did that? Because when you met a schizophrenic, someone who was schizophrenic, you know, not only were they paranoid, a lot of times they were disorganized in thought. Or they had these other delusions. It was never that clear. You know, sure, the paranoid one gets a lot of press because, you know, it's easy to identify and uh, more often than not, a lot of uh, people who were schizophrenic uh, had those kinds of thoughts. But it wasn't that, it wasn't it alone. They usually had others. So it, it's on a spectrum and it's now a subtype under the delusional disorders. Also, the idea of voices conversing with each other are gone. Frankly, I, in my clinical experiences over the last, I'll tell you how many years, <laughs> let's say 30 plus, 
I rarely ever see a work with schizophrenic who had two or more voices. What they would tell you is they would have commanding demands, voice, telling them to do things that they would adhere to. That, you know, was ideas of reference outside of themselves, but not two or more. Even more rare, and for those of you who do the forensic work for malingering, is uh, visual hallucinations are typically not part of the schizophrenic picture. And people's, you know, I'll, and I'll ask people who like come to me for disability vows, and uh, I say, you have a hallucination? Oh yeah, I see shadows going by, I see people all the time. And Now, people who are older, uh, demented, people with dementia will have uh, visions of, of presence, like a loved one in a room with them. And now that's true, that I can, but a young schizophrenic rarely ever has to have the vision. But anyway, uh, you don't need that anymore. The requirement now for a diagnosis of schizophrenia, you must have at least one of the three positive symptoms, which would be delusions, hallucination, and disorganized speech. One of those three have to be present in doing that. Uh, again, uh, what's eliminated is body focus, repetitive behaviors, that's now under uh, obsessive compulsive disorders. The subtypes are gone for schizophrenia, but they do find themselves in the, in the, the different delusions. Uh, as well. Another significant change is the schizoaffective disorder and delusional disorder, which we kind of touched a little bit. But schizoaffective disorder was one of the, those areas that was so confusing in the DSM-5. I wasn't ever really clear. I had a good handle on it. They have done such a much better job. And basically it's this. You meet the criteria for schizophrenia, and you meet the criteria for a mood disorder overlaid on the schizophrenia. So you're not only, you know, you meet the diagnosis for, for uh, schizophrenia uh, as well with, you know, one of the three uh, uh, symptoms that we talked about earlier, but a major mood disorder, either bipolar or depression. Now, to the lay person, you say, oh, this person is schizophrenic and is bipolar. That's pretty bad, and it's true. However, the prognosis for those people who are schizoaffective is better than those who are schizophrenic with negative symptoms. We haven't talked much about negative symptoms, but those are the ones that are avolitional, catatonic, uh, not much energy. These guys put out energy, and they can be worked with, and they'll be interactive. So they have a greater chance of uh, overcoming it. Uh, so kudos again to DSM-5 for, uh, for straightening that out for us and doing that. Uh, we talked about that uh, quickly, catatonia, uh, we'll go through that. That still is under uh, the, the, uh, the, the psychotic uh, uh, disorders. Catatonia can be part of other disorders as well, as, along, along with having uh, its own diagnosis. I evaluated a, a, a nice lady. Her sister was a physician taking care of her sister, and this, this was out in uh, Osceola, in the county. I had to do an evaluation for social care. I had to go to the home because she would never leave the home. And I would talk to, the, to the, her sister who would talk about the sister that I was going to evaluate, so I talked to the MD and she said, oh yeah, she can take care of herself, no problem, but I'm just letting you know when you come, she may stay frozen and not do anything. I said, okay. And I probably have evaluated maybe six in my lifetime like that. The bottom line is I go to the house, the house is immaculate, beautiful home on a lake, clean. The sister is a physician there. And I asked her, where's your sister? She's in the laundry room. I go to the laundry room. She is just sitting there frozen. I spent about an hour and a half talking to the, to the, the MD, went back. She hadn't moved an hour and a half. Not, and when I say haven't moved, I'm, not, I'm talking about no eye blinks, nothing. That's how significant that was. Uh, so it, it's there. Uh, some of the other symptom requirements, you've got to have three out of 12. Some of them are stupor 
catalepsy, if anybody have ever seen anybody with catalepsy, that's an interesting phenomenon where uh, somebody's muscles just give away and they just fall out. You might see this with younger kids with narcolepsy. Uh, mutism, posturing, people just staying frozen in space like this uh, lady that I evaluated and doing that. Okay, I'm gonna, I guess we're gonna take a, a if there's a question and because I think we're gonna take a break now. Do All right, we're going to take 15 minutes. Uh, well, actually, before break, somebody asked about the F at the beginning of the alphanumeric codes. And is that like a, does that mean mental disorders or something? When I went through and looked on break, the vast majority of the codes in the DSM-5 start with an F. But there are just a handful of them that don't. And those look to me like disorders that people would, would traditionally think of as physical or medical disorders. So I'm going to say probably the F in ICD language is mental disorder, um, just by the way things look. The second question is, I was asked for clarification on when exactly is the licensure exam for mental health counselors, which is the NCMHC, I believe, when is it implementing a DSM-5? I think I told you all February. Um, before we went to the break. That's wrong. It's actually April. It's April 2014. So I went and checked. Um, I actually have an email from the board saying that. So hopefully that's really at April 2014. Okay, so let's go ahead and pick up with bipolar and related disorders. Um, not a lot has changed with bipolar disorders. Really, um, it's essentially the same thing. In Criterion A, there was a verbiage change. Um, they are emphasizing that bipolar disorder isn't just about changes in mood, those mood fluctuations between depression and mania or hypomania, but it's also about changes in activity and energy. So they really wanted to highlight that with that verbiage change. And there used to be a separate um, ICD-9 code for bipolar disorder mixed episode. And what that did was it, it made things pretty difficult for um, a clinician, especially if you have a limited amount of time with a client. You had to figure out, okay, so I know they have both manic and depressive episodes. Do they sometimes have symptoms of both occurring at once? And if so, is it the exact number of symptoms for each that are required for it to be a full-blown episode? And is it therefore a mixed episode? And that could be very time-consuming to figure out. And the clients oftentimes don't know exactly what number of symptoms were occurring at once. So it was really a lot of time spent for very little benefit. What they've now done is instead of having a separate diagnostic code for a bipolar disorder with a mixed episode, you just have bipolar disorder and you can add a specifier if you want with mixed features. You don't have to figure out exactly the number of symptoms of each. You just have to know that there are some manic or hypomanic symptoms co-occurring with depressive symptoms, and that's enough for you to add that specifier with mixed features. It makes it all much easier and simpler if you're a diagnostician. Um, I like the change myself. So um, we have the other specified bipolar and related disorder, um, and the uh, uh, and that's, again, getting rid of the NOS, and then you specify why, are, why do they not fit into the regular bipolar disorder. We also have a new specifier with anxious distress. And that can be used for if you have somebody with bipolar disorder, and they've got some symptoms of anxiety that you want to treat or that you think are important to communicate to whoever is going to be accessing that diagnosis, but they don't necessarily meet you know, diagnostic criteria for a full-blown anxiety disorder. But the anxiety nonetheless is significant and it's important and it needs to be addressed. So you can add that specifier at the end if you choose to. Now, yes? That with anxious distress, uh -huh. is that only to be used with the bipolar? Nope. Also will be used for, we're going to get to in a second, with depressive disorders also. So we get two new diagnoses here with depressive disorders. These are some of the more controversial changes with the DSM-5. The first is disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, and the second is premenstrual dysphoric disorder. I'm going to go into those. I'm going to go through the, the diagnostic criteria for those two disorders in just a moment. 
um, and show them to you. But before we do that, there's another change they made. Um, dysthymic disorder was like that sort of gray cloud constantly following somebody. It was that mild depressive disorder that was very persistent, lasting two years or longer. But then you also had, if somebody had major depressive disorder, and that depressive episode was at least two years long, we would call that major depressive disorder chronic. Well, they said, what's the difference between chronic major depressive disorder and dysthymic disorder? Severity, right? That's the only difference really between the two. So they decided, well, this makes sense to take those two, collapse them together into one diagnosis called persistent depressive disorder. It will range in severity from mild to severe. Mild would be dysthymia, and then the moderate to severe would be what used to be that uh, chronic major depressive disorder. So now getting into the controversial stuff, and we're about to show some very specific uh, um, diagnostic criteria here. So disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Um, there, the criticism with this disorder is, oh my gosh, we are now going to pathologize temper tantrums in kids. That's, that's what the fear is. Let's look at the diagnostic criteria. You have to have severe recurrent temper outbursts manifested verbally, like verbal rages, and or behaviorally physical aggression towards people or property that are grossly out of proportion in intensity or duration to the situation or provocation. Got to be inconsistent with the developmental level, what's considered the norm for that age group. And they have to occur on average three or more times per week. And that, that uh, the mood between temper outbursts is persistently irritable or angry most of the day, nearly every day, and is observable by others. And it's got to, these, those symptoms have got to be present for 12 or more months. During that time, they cannot have a period lasting three or more consecutive months without all of the symptoms in criterion A through D. And it's got to be present in at least two of three settings. Can't just be in one setting that we see these symptoms. Has to be at least a couple settings, like home, school, um, with peers, on the playground, whatever else. Can't make the diagnosis before age six or after age 18. So this is a juvenile only diagnosis. Um, so here's the, here's the situation. The reason why they created persistent depressive disorder is that they found that the kids who had these symptoms, which, I mean, this is clinically significant impairment or distress. This is something that needs an intervention. Um, this is something um, that uh, the, the children in this diagnostic category are expected to respond to treatment. But what they found is that the kids who met these kinds of symptoms historically have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And it is believed that many of them were misdiagnosed, in part because a large number of them, as adults, would suddenly be healed of their bipolar disorder and it would no longer exist. The symptoms would be gone. Yes? How is this differentiated from intermittent explosive disorder? But, um, from intermittent dis explosive disorder? Um, well, with this disorder, with intermittent explosive disorder, which is one of the disorders in your section, I guess, my recollection is that these things kind of come out of nowhere and the person recognizes that this is excessive and, and they, they don't feel like they have a lot of control over them kind of a thing. This is somebody who's persistently irritable and uh, um, it's not kind of it just comes out of nowhere sort of a thing, but they've got this persistent mood going on. That's my understanding, but... Right, well, I don't intermittent, there's, there's some event, but the reaction is far greater than what's warranted. <coughs> Where this is, like he's saying, this kid is kind of always down, and there's agitation usually. Whenever you're around this kid, you're, you see that he's mm -hmm. uh, a depressed kid, and then pow, explodes. And that is one of the um, uh, disorders, intermittent explosive disorder, is one of the ones that... Uh, cannot can co-occur with this disorder. You have to differentiate between the two. 
So um, what they found is, okay, so these kids are often getting mislabeled as bipolar, and then we're treating them with bipolar uh, medications. And as adults, they're, you know, bipolar is not a temporary disorder. It's considered a chronic disorder. So they seem to be misdiagnosed. Their hope is that they would cut down on the number of kids being misdiagnosed and mislabeled. But the controversy is, you know, will clinicians sort of, obviously by the design of the disorder, it's not intended to be your typical tam temper tantrum, but the fear is, could clinicians be labeling kids with sort of developmentally appropriate temper tantrums with this disorder, and then they're being pathologized. So that's the, the apprehension about it. So then, um, uh, full disclosure, I do not have any personal experience with menstruation. And so, in some ways, I am unqualified <laughs> to, to talk about that experience. Um, this disorder, um, first I'm going I'm to walk you through the disorder. It's very controversial. Then we'll talk about the controversy, the criticism, and we'll talk about the defense against the criticism. So what I basically got is, in the majority of menstrual cycles, at least five symptoms must be present in the final week before the onset of menses, start to improve within a few days after the onset, and become minimal or absent in the week post menses. One or more of the following symptoms must be present, marked effective lability, mood swings, feeling suddenly sad or tearful, increased sensitivity to rejection, marked irritability or anger or increased interpersonal conflicts, marked depressed mood, feelings of hopelessness or self-deprecating thoughts, marked anxiety, tension, feelings of being keyed up or on edge, and one or more of the following symptoms must additionally be present to reach a total of five symptoms when combined with symptoms from criterion B. Decreased interest in unusual, uh, or unusual activities, that's that anhedonia. Um, I'm not, I don't find the interest or pleasure in things that I normally would enjoy, a more depressive symptom. That difficulty concentrating, um, fatigue, lack of energy, changes in appetite, like overeating or specific food cravings, cravings hypersomnia or insomnia, so the sleep cycle gets off, sense of being overwhelmed or out of control, physical symptoms, and uh, um, symptom criteria A through C must have been met for most menstrual cycles that occurred in the previous year, not just maybe a couple isolated incidents. And it's got to be causing clinically significant impairment or distress. And that's a key phrase when we're looking at mental disorders. Most disorders are based on the idea that it's not just the symptoms. It's the level of impairment and distress that it's causing for the individual in front of you. So here's the deal. Um, one of the criticisms is we've now pathologized you know, menstruation. And... Uh, and some, uh, especially uh, female critics, will say, you know, <laughs> that's, some of this is kind of normal stuff for us to experience, right? So that all makes sense. And when I first, you know, was exposed to, uh, this was in DSM-4, if I recall correctly, in Section 3 or whatever it was to be considered for future um, revisions or future editions. It was a, two clients of mine told me on this diagnosis. One client was um, uh, referred because of a DUI. The DUI um, was the only DUI and the only arrest in the person's history. Um, very high alcohol level, very high alcohol. I can't remember what it was, but it was really high alcohol level. Um, doesn't normally drink alcohol at all. Uh, has been Baker acted on a few occasions, has lost jobs during these episodes, has had suicidal thoughts, intentions, plans, has become violent and aggressive when normally a very passive and patient individual. And what she said is, it's only during the period specified in this diagnosis that I experienced these symptoms, never outside of them, 
very high functioning except for during these episodes. But during these episodes, that mood dysregulation is severe enough that we're talking unemployment, we're talking medication with alcohol, alcohol abuse, arrests, violence and aggression, suicidal thoughts and intentions only during these periods. And it was not until she said, you know, I've met with a couple psychiatrists who said, <laughs> normal women stuff. Felt completely invalidated by that. Found a psychiatrist who said, yes, the data is clear. We are talking about a small subset of women. I think it's like 1% if I remember correctly. We might want to look, or less than that in the DSM because it gives you the statistical information. Small subset of women who, who um, meet this criteria. And she says, it wasn't until I met with a psychiatrist who knew this is not normal menstrual stuff we're talking about here. And treated it as such, as a medical disorder, appropriate medication, appropriate psychotherapy, and was able to get enough control during those episodes that she could function in the real world. So she kind of sold me on it. And then I got a second client with a very similar um, situation. So I understand the criticism. Oh, what if we're over pathologizing? But clear to me, it's, there are clear cases where there are people who are meeting this criteria. It's, it, above and beyond what normally happens, clinically significant impairment or stress, need treatment, and benefit from treatment. So that's kind of the case for it in my head. So I'll pause in case there are any questions or comments or criticisms, because there usually is at about this point. Yes? I am not experienced with the I know. Oh, you, like me, are inexperienced with this. OK, <laughs> yeah. all right. Yeah. Um, but, but, but I have had women in my life who I to me to me to me looking at the diagnosis to me looking at the diagnosis I think when perhaps perhaps I'm what is what is a normal part of the female body? And I, I I think I think we're doing that, and I get what you're saying, but maybe in that in that small sub 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 set of cases, okay, but I mean if if. If if I go back and read the diagnosis, I don't see anything about arrests or DUIs or something like that. So um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna just say that diagnosis makes me uncomfortable. Okay, so you share the criticisms, the yes. concerns yes. about this diagnosis. Yes. Okay, yeah, yes. Well, in the case of the, the two clients I worked with, one of them, it was um, an antidepressant, was the medication, and then psychotherapy, um, and responded well. The symptoms substantially um, decreased. The other one was both an antidepressant and a mood stabilizer because the aggression was so severe and, and f again, responded very well to it. Um, uh, actually had a female psychiatric ARNP who is um, very educated in this area and worked very well with her and, and validated that no, this is not your typical sort of like PMS kind of situation or something. Um, this is something that's way above the curve. It's causing major distress. So, um, you know, I, I don't really know a whole lot about the treatment for it, but I know in those two cases kind of what the treatment was. Um, I saw another question over here I want to get to before I go over there. It was just about treatment. Like, so okay. something hormonal, is it medication mostly because of the dysregulation? And, and you answered Oh, you know, one of my clients was on some, um, was seeing a separate physician for some hormonal uh, kind of medication, some hor hormonal therapy. I don't know what the medications were. So, yeah, maybe that's part of it too, hormonal treatments. I don't know. You got an answer for us? Uh, well, the incident rate was 7 to 3.7%. 7 
one point seven to three point seven. Oh, about two and a half percent. So it's a little bit larger than I thought it was. They're saying that two and a half percent of women would meet this criteria. Okay. In terms of treatment, uh, it might say something about treatment. Yeah, there's treatment. <laughs> okay. Uh, we don't know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the DSM-3 had it, I believe, as a condition to be studied for the future, yeah. for adoption in a future revision. And so with the DSM-5, it was adopted because apparently the panel concluded that there was sufficient evidence that this is a real disorder, that this is legitimate and should be adopted. I don't know, maybe you could look for it, but I'm pretty sure it's in the, it was in the DSM-4, but not, a, not an actual diagnosis. Birth control that even before this diagnosis, obviously, this was a couple years ago. That the advertisement for it said that it was the only birth control that also assessed the symptoms of PMDD, and it goes into mm. that it's more violent, more aggressive. You're talking about people getting arrested, things like that. And so that's the only time I heard of it was. So maybe there's a uh, birth control medication also. Right. Okay. Yeah. There was a question over here. I know. Yes. I know also that part of diagnosis with this is for clients to be mood charting along with um, charting their cycles to look for correlation. Um, and if you don't have the mood symptoms outside of that specific period of time, but it's pretty um, repetitive that you're going to have the symptoms during that time to the point of significant impairment or distress, well, you're really building a case for it. Anybody else? Yes. This is more just a comment than a question, but it, it, it's worrisome that this is a, an official diagnosis now, yeah. just for the yeah. women's movement in general. Yeah. To, to know mm -hmm. what you're saying, young man, is that there is one of the diagnoses that would be most likely to be removed would be that. Right? Yeah. Say, in the near future, or come under a somatic uh, symptoms. Right. Like. And things right. like that. Yeah. It's just another way to differentiate gender. To me. Yeah, there's a legitimate valid concern that this is, I mean, this is, and when you look at appreciating, you know, um, women's rights, and um, could this be used against women to pathologize being female? The, and then the other side of the coin is that, okay, so this client wouldn't have been able to access um, legitimate treatment. Insurance companies won't pay if there's not a diagnosis. Um, you know, so then some women will be left untreated. They won't have the resources because it's not a real thing. It's just a woman thing. It's normal. And so there, it becomes a balancing act. And I don't know if there's a good answer for that. For that. Mm. And I think I want more like of oh, what okay. you're saying, like behavior and stuff like that. So what would help what would help what you think would help is that they get much more specific in defining some of these vague terms. Because then you can't just lay it on somebody like bipolar disorder, like your manic episode asked the last seven days or whatever it is. Like you it needs to be stricter so that you're not just being able to give it great. Mm. So uh, I hate to say this, but I gotta move on because how much time do I have? 
Uh, two minutes. All right, two minutes. Okay, so we're going to move quick. All right, so the other big thing that we, we talked about, um, others with mixed features, we talked about that with bipolar disorder, also applies to depressive disorders. This is controversial, the bereavement exclusion. I really got to spend a couple minutes on this, even though um, I'm about out of time here. The bereavement exclusion, again, uh, concern we're going to pathologize brief, grief, uh, I mean. So there used to be in the DSM-4, um, an exclusion that if um, if the person was experiencing bereavement that they wouldn't get that it wouldn't be considered a major depressive episode up to a certain time duration I can't remember what it was they removed that and the case for it was um, a few different things one of them was okay um, clinically significant impairment or distress um, they need some help and they respond well to treatment if somebody has a major depressive episode, even if it was triggered by a loss, um, then they need treatment, they benefit from it. Another argument was only a small percentage of people while grieving meet the full criteria for a major depressive episode, and that percentage of people um, tend to have genetic predispositions for depression, and tend to have had depressive episodes in the past and this becomes a trigger point for the next depressive episode, that doesn't make it a fake depressive episode, and they still need help. And they said, plus we don't exclude other psychosocial events that trigger a depressive episode, so why would we make a magical exclusion for bereavement, but not for something like job loss, or you know, I, I lost a limb or something. You know, so they said, whatever it is that triggers, if it's still an unusual, you know, we're talking about major depressive episode, clinical distress, warrants treatment, responds to treatment, um, then does it make sense to make an exclusion just for this one thing? So that's the case for it. And then again, the concern is we're going to pathologize grief. It's not most people who are grieving that meet the criteria for a major depressive episode. And that's something important to pay attention to. So anxiety disorders, uh, we talked about um, uh, PTSD is uh, kind of alluded to it earlier, moved into a different chapter along with acute stress disorder. And OCD is moved into a different chapter as well. We'll get more into that in a little bit. Um, it used to be that the person had to recognize that their anxiety was excessive or unreasonable in order to be diagnosed with agoraphobia, specific phobia, or social anxiety disorder, which used to be social phobia. No longer is that necessary. Because you can have a person who has, cl again, clinically significant impairment or distress, they meet all the symptoms, but if they say, no, I think it's normal, you know, maybe they're defensive or whatever else, then they don't get a diagnosis. And they said, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So they got rid of that. Also used to, be, there's a six month duration requirement if the person's under 18. They extended that to include all individuals. Um, because they wanted to really make sure that we're not talking about a temporary adjustment to a temporary psych acute psychosocial stressor. We want to make sure this is something a little bit more enduring um, before we call it an anxiety disorder versus a trauma or stressor related disorder that we'll get to again in a moment. Panic attacks, some, panic attacks, some minor verbiage changes. They unlinked panic disorder and agoraphobia. It used to be in our DSM-4, you could only diagnose agoraphobia in connection with panic disorder. But the reality is, there are people who have agoraphobia, and again, clinically significant impairment or stress, warrants treatment, responds well to treatment, but do not meet the criteria for panic disorder. So they would just sort of skate underneath the diagnostic threshold. No longer since they unlinked the two. The data seemed pretty clear that, uh, that oftentimes they were not linked together. Some uh, minor verbiage changes with social phobia specifiers. Separation anxiety disorder. Um, a, let's see here. Oh, this is big. You can diagnose separation anxiety disorder in adults now. The onset doesn't have to be during childhood. So again, but what is, you know, I kind of think of this from an attachment sort of standpoint. I mean, people, some people have some um, particularly abnormal or unhealthy or severe a attachment um, constellations. Yeah. So, um, bottom line is, clinically significant impairment or distress, does it warrant treatment? Do they respond well to treatment? And those are important issues to consider as part of why they extended this to adults. So what, we become adults and then we imagine we just no longer can have this sort of thing happen to us. Selective mutism, 
um, was recruited into the anxiety disorder chapter from the old childhood disorders chapter that we got rid of. Because selective mutism seems very much connected to anxiety. You know, we move from town A to town B, new environment, six-year-old kids going to a new school now, never talks anymore, will not talk in school. Seems to be clearly an anxiety sort of a link there, so they thought it would make sense to go in that chapter. Um, obsessive, compulsive, and related disorders. We've got some new disorders, hoarding disorder, excoriation, or skin picking disorder are the two biggies to take a look at. Uh, we're now going to go into the specific diagnostic criteria for our camera person, if the slide's being shown. Okay. So, um, how many of you have been seeing the shows? And you've been waiting for this to happen? So, persistent difficulty discarding or parting with possessions regardless of their value, even if it has no monetary value or even emotional value sometimes. Um, just can't get rid of the stuff. Um, they have a perceived need to save them and distress associated with discarding them. For some of them, it is like I'm giving up a part of my life if I let go of this or a time period of my life or something, even if it, by itself it doesn't really have value. Um, so we get this accumulation of possessions and it causes congestion and clutter, creates safety hazards, health hazards in many situations. Can't even maneuver around the house. Accidents and injuries happen because of it in some cases. Clinically significant impairment or distress that's not attributable to another medical condition. And then you get these specifiers like with excessive acquisition. You can um, add a specifier for their level of insight. Do they recognize um, that this is a problem and how, how much insight do they seem to have about it? Excoriation or skin picking disorder to you know, give you the brief version. Recurrent skin picking resulting in skin lesions. And I remember when I was in junior high, I had a classmate who I think pretty clearly had this disorder and um, would be picking and picking and picking to the point of blood and um, scabs and all this other stuff. Everyone would make fun of her. She was ostracized because of it. She couldn't seem to stop anyway, even though she really wanted to. Now could be uh, diagnosed and treated. And... Uh, Impulse control disorder, recruited trichotillomania. Okay, so trichotillomania or hair pulling disorder was moved from the old impulse control disorder into the obsessive compulsive and related disorder chapter. And we get uh, specifiers. It used to be, I think, a specifier of poor insight, but now you have more options. You can say good or fair insight, poor insight, or absent or delusional beliefs. And then you get that new tick related specifier. Um, they add, in body dysmorphic disorder, they added a criterion about uh, repetitive behaviors or mental acts in response to the preoccupations with those defects, perceived defects or flaws in appearance. And a new specifier with muscle dysmorphia. That's about the build, the muscle mass, those sorts of things. And man, I'm really going over with time, aren't I? Acute stress disorder and PTSD. Now we're getting into that chapter, that new chapter, trauma and stress-related disorders. Um, they want us to be very um, explicit about what are the qualifying traumatic events. So, um, were they experienced directly, or witnessed or experienced indirectly? You do not have to have literally been the person who the traumatic event happened to to get the diagnosis. I will give you a case example of this. There was a woman I worked with, again, a, this was a DUI case. This was a person who did not seem to have an underlying alcohol use disorder, but had some alcohol abuse going on. The alcohol abuse occurred during a period of time where there were some very active symptoms of PTSD. This is how she, she got the PTSD diagnosis. Her job, after, now during 9-11, she did not live in New York City, she wasn't a part of what happened and nothing happened to any of her friends or family. After 9-11, she takes a job in New York City. Her job is that for eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, she must listen to 911 call transcripts from that day. She gets to hear people in the process of dying, people about to die, people who are watching other people die, people who are saying their last goodbyes to their loved ones, um, 
all of these things day after day, week after week, month after month, and developed severe PTSD. So again, you don't have to have directly experienced the event yourself. And so um, crisis responders, therapists who do a lot of work with trauma, um, theoretically could all uh, meet the criteria if the symptoms are present, sufficient for the diagnosis. Um, the, the diagnostic threshold was lowered for children and adolescents in order to be more developmentally sensitive. And reactive attachment disorder used to have two subtypes that were like opposite ends of the same pole. On one end, would have the emotionally withdrawn or inhibited. And on the other hand, the indiscriminately social or disinhibited. Well, the inhibited side of the spectrum, this would be like, you know, isn't um, appropriately attaching to, to figures in their life. And on the other end of the spectrum, the detached, or the, I'm sorry, the uh, disinhibited actually, would be like, you know, you're picking up your kid from daycare, another kid runs up to you you've never seen before, oh my gosh, I really like your shoes, talks, 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 tells you about what they did that day and played, and then wants to go home with you. And you just met them for the first time and have no idea who they are. Um, the reason why they were both lumped together into one disorder previously is that they both seem to be connected to trauma, um, to childhood trauma. But just because they have the same underlying etiology, the symptom presentation was so dramatically different and the underlying neurobiology is very different. So they felt it would be better, it would make more sense to split them into two separate disorders. Reactive attachment disorder on one hand, a disinhibited social engagement disorder on the other. And now um, we're going to move into Dr. T's segment here on dissociative disorders. <laughs>